Good afternoon from Asia Society Hong Kong Center. Uh, I am Alice Wong, Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong. And it is really my great pleasure um, to uh, welcome you to, to the, this afternoon's program. Uh, we're going to give you a latest update from Myanmar. And I'm delighted today that we're joined by four um, observers uh, of, of the Myanmar situation. Two of them are based in uh, Yangon right now, and then one is uh, joining us from Japan, and the other one, our moderator, uh, Professor Ian Holiday, is joining us here from Hong Kong. Uh, and it's thanks to Professor Holiday that we can put together this program for you this afternoon in a very short period of time. Uh, thanks to Professor Holiday, who's been working with us here at Hong Kong Center uh, since the center's opening in 2012 on a variety of programs uh, focusing on developments in Myanmar and uh, in. This latest situation, I think, really came out of, uh, you know, morning of February 1st, uh, when all of us uh, saw on the news, the military of Myanmar uh, staged a coup. And from then on, we've all been kind of following this news. And we're really delighted that we do have observers who can give us uh, the latest. Uh, the four speakers, the three panelists, and uh, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, first of all, Romain, Romain Kayo is joining us from Japan, and he is a risk and reputation management consultant, uh, has spent some time, uh, he's currently based in Japan, but Romain has, was based prior in Singapore and in Myanmar, and actually uh, uh, worked in Myanmar in 2006 in, uh, with the French embassy as an uh, intern analyst. And he returned in 2008 to 2015 uh, when he studied Burmese at the Yangon University, and we're really delighted he can join joining us today. Uh, a. Fang is a co-translator of human rights, uh, politics, and practice uh, by, Michael, by Professor Michael Goldar, and he's international rights law by uh, Rana Smith and liberalism and democracy in Myanmar by Roman David and Ian Holiday. He has extensive work experience in the development sector, and we're delighted that he's joining us uh, from Yangon. And he's also a student uh, at University of Hong Kong and also Master of Science, received his Master of Science in International Relations and Development Study from School of Oriental and African Study in, um, in London. Uh, Kain Lin Thu was born and raised in Myanmar, and she He had also a university, HKUG scholarship and master's in, in development management at London School of Economic and Political Science. So we're today's uh, moderator, Professor Ian Holiday, has been vice president teaching and learning at the University of Hong Kong since 2015. And he was previously the dean of social science at Hong Kong U and dean of humanity and social science at City University of Hong Kong. His research focus is on Myanmar politic and governance, and we're delighted uh, that he's going to moderate today's discussion. I'm going to hand it over to Professor Ian Holiday to get the program started. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alice. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by my three panelists today. Uh, we're looking at the latest from Myanmar, and we're going to begin by just considering what's happened in the last couple of days. It was a a devastating Armed Forces Day on Saturday, Lynn. And I'm just wondering, what is the situation as of now in Myanmar? Yeah, so uh, the protests are still ongoing, but the uh, crackdown, the brutal crackdown is uh, quite uh, bad in city, uh, big cities like Yangon and Mandalay. Uh, however, the protests are still ongoing in other parts of Myanmar, including the rural, like more rural area. Yesterday, in a city, a smaller city like Kali, they had another like uh, brutal crackdown. So uh, the protests are still ongoing, and then there is also a civil disobedience movement, uh, the movement led by public uh, servants to stop the bureaucratic mechanism of the um, haunter. And uh, it is also still uh, really strong. Uh, but then like, as we expected, the, the military dictator has responded to the situation uh, with like, really like brutally. So the international community, like they need to wake up to the true scale of the brutality. So uh, on, only on the 27th, uh, uh, alone like they it is the day they celebrate the 
um, M Force, the, uh, the founding uh, of the Myanmar military, like it is called M Force Day, and then they have the celebration and parade in Nebiro. But at the same time, they kill over 100 uh, peaceful protesters around the country uh, only on that day. Uh, so far, the military has killed over 400 protesters and they have arrested over 3,000 3, like, uh, people, including the journalists, uh, protesters, uh, civil servants participating in civil disobedience movements, and also uh, a lot of political activists and politicians. Uh, they they use a lethal force uh, against the peaceful protesters, including hand grenades, uh, machine guns, snipers, and of course, like rifles and ri life rounds. And uh, there are several um, confirmed cases of like torture to death. So it is like uh, they arrest a person at night and in the morning, uh, they ask the people to like the uh, dead, body, uh, dead body of the person. So, uh, and then uh, more than uh, 20 children were killed so far. The youngest victim so far is only five years old. And uh, there are like indiscriminate shooting on the in the streets. Uh, even people who are just passing by the uh, to get the grocery or stuff like that, they can be shot at any time. So uh, in uh, cities like Yangon, it, uh, people are even like afraid to go out on the street. And there is also like internet shutdown. Uh, the, the the military. Uh, give direct, uh, direction to the uh, mobile operator to shut down all the like 4G uh, mobile internet. So the information flow is has been cut down, like only the wire and then like fiber internet is available. So uh, in big city like Yangon and Medley, we still have the connection, but in the rural area, it is really difficult to get the uh, information like uh, to them and then like information from their uh, places. So uh, the number of casualties and death could be higher, but uh, it's uh, difficult to trace the numbers. Thanks, Lynn. Ethan, it's been eight weeks today since the coup um, uh, suddenly hit us as, as, a, as a shock wave that, that not only hit Myanmar, but also much of the rest of the world. Casting your mind back to February the 1st, what, what was it that triggered that coup? And, and why have we now found ourselves in this situation? Thanks uh, very much. Before I say anything, uh, I would like to uh, pay respects to the more, more than 430 people who have been killed in the course of uh, democracy and freedom in, in this country. Um, so um, uh, um, uh, by now we have learned that there has been a bit of, there had been a bit of built up before, before the coup. Some people say that the, uh, the counter actually uh, planned for it you know, more than a year ahead. But I think to, to give, to give uh, the audience a bit of background, uh, let me start with the, uh, one of the, the NLD's, um, the, the ruling party uh, key policies, which is uh, national reconciliation. And by that, they want to have reconciliation with, with, with the army. And uh, to a lesser extent, I think the embassy was actually more on having national reconciliation with, with the army rather than um, with the ethnic minorities, for example. So uh, even before the NLD came into power, you know, when they were, when, even when they were prosecuted, you know, with, with most of their senior leaders being, you know, in, in jail and so on, they, they kept, they were consistent with this national reconciliation policy. So when they came to power, you know, in 2015, they had, they had the same policy. So a good example, for example, a good example of this would be, uh, you know, their plan for uh, the constitutional amendment. So unlike other minority groups, which wanted a more uh, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, a more rapid or for like a better word, transition for the military out of politics, the NLD actually proposed a gradual and face saving exit out of politics but then uh, but then none of you know uh, the the military bloc at the parliament you know the 25 percent that they had reserved for themselves they didn't agree to even a trivial uh, proposal on on out of a host of uh, 
uh, more substantive uh, proposals for constitutional change. So that was a clear message from the military that they were not ready to, you know, to, 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 to get out of, to, to exit out of politics anytime soon, soon and they, they want to keep on, uh, they wanted to keep on their, their kind of unconstitutional, undemocratic privileges uh, uh, across all the, all, all the, all the pillars of, uh, you know, government in the country. So uh, the, 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 if, we, if we get closer to the, uh, to the coup, uh, we have, so after that, I think the, the NLD maybe changed, uh, changed their tactics and maybe they, they decided to be a bit more confrontational. So we have heard that they were more uh, coming, they were more cracking down on, for example, the, the economic complex controlled by the military through their anti-corruption and, you know, the economic regulatory uh, framework and so on. And if we get closer to the, uh, to the coup, uh, for instance, I have I have heard from sources that uh, uh, the, the the senior general May online wanted to, wanted his tenure extended, or you know wanted you know wanted his presidency promised by the military. And the, the context of this is that uh, his his tenure as the senior uh, general of the military, the, the commander in chief of the military had already expired. He had become too old to be you know, legally eligible uh, for this position. And then he wanted the NLD led government and the, the president to, to extend his tenure. So how, that, how this works uh, in the framework of Myanmar's 2008 constitution is that the, uh, there is the so-called National Defense and Security Council wh whose membership is controlled by six to five by the military. So they have they have kind of a, a, they have an upper a, a majority. So but, but the thing is, the the NSDC, the National Defense and Security Council meeting, has to be called by the president, who is of course appoint uh, you know controlled by the NLD. So only by so the the president, according to like the Article three four two of the Constitution, the president has to appoint the commander in chief with approval from this NSDC. So the, the, given the fact that the NLD had consistently refused to call for a single National Defense and Security Council meeting, you know, it leaves, it, it left Mayola in sort of political or sort of legal limbo. You know, his continued existence had been illegal, you know, as far as the 2008 constitution is concerned. So, you know, he was in a, in a really precarious situation and all of these factors combined, uh, we, you know, I, I think led to the coup uh, on the on the first of February. Thanks. Lynn already mentioned the toll in in, in human life, and so did you. You know, at least four hundred lives. We're, we're counting towards five hundred, unfortunately. Um, there's also the economic impact. Um, we know that there was a silent protest, and we know that much economic activity has just been overwhelmed by by street protest. What impact is the is the coup and, and the aftermath having on eco, on economic uh, livelihoods of the people? Yeah, thanks. Well, as I am no economist, I will just share with my sort of uh, layman's observations on what's been uh, happening. So, the, the first of all, it's 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 important to remember that the uh, 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 there is a large informal segment to Myanmar's economy, and by this I mean that. Uh, in, in big cities like uh, Yangon, Mandalay, and, and like Dangji and uh, other, other, uh, other smaller towns, a lot of people make their living on a daily basis on the streets. So given the fact that, you know, all these streets are empty and all these urban spaces have been turned into sort of ghost uh, towns, you know, hundreds of thousands of people can no longer make their living on the street. So to give you one concrete example, uh, one of the one of the townships in Yangon, which has been the most heavily cracked down by by the hunters, uh, armed thugs, uh, uh, I think like hundreds of thousands of internal migrant workers now by now have left the area and they are back in their home hometowns without a job, you know, which they need to to keep on supporting uh, their their families. So uh, for ex and 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 the other. Uh, Figure is according to the to the to the World Bank, uh, they have the, the World Bank has now uh, 
downgraded the, the outlook for Myanmar's economy, saying that it would contract by 10%, which I think uh, it, it, it's a quite significant downturn. And the other thing is from, from war, is warning from the, w, the, the World Food Program in Myanmar that you know, now millions of people risk uh, being fall into, uh, in, into uh, you know, really uh, abject poverty and, 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 and many people would go hungry as you know, uh, prices for basic commodities have now uh, uh, significantly risen. Mm, thanks very much. Lynn, there's, a, there's a, a lot of appeal from the street, both through banners and also through social media to the wider world, to the international community. What is it that people want in Myanmar from the international community? Thanks, Ian. So in short, Myanmar people want military intervention, but uh, we kind of realize that it's <laughs> nearly impossible. Uh, so uh, there are several other things that uh, people have been asking. Uh, for example, like the global arms embargo, uh, the military, they produce like smaller weapons, uh, uh, like uh, rifles and guns uh, in Myanmar, but then like they have to buy larger weapons like fighter jets and then submarines from like uh, foreign countries like Russia and India. Um, so uh, people are uh, asking the UN to like impose uh, global arms embargo on the uh, on the military so that the brutal crackdown like uh, can at least like uh, be deterred to a certain extent. And uh, today, uh, like recently, like the ethnic armed organization in Myanmar, they started uh, fighting against the uh, military. And then yesterday, the military uh, uh, used the fighter jets against uh, uh, the one of the brigades of the uh, in the current area. And uh, over one thousand people had to like flee from uh, their house uh, because of these like. Uh, the use of airstrike and people are now talking about like the UN to like set up the no flying zone uh, uh, at least like uh, in the ethnic areas because the military is using the, uh, the that kind of like heavy weaponry uh, people uh, the civilians on the ground are suffering so much so uh, people also talk about like setting up the no flying zone and then the other thing is uh, to recognize the uh, legitimacy of the uh, uh, PRPH, uh, which is the committee like uh, formed with the uh, elected uh, representative from the 2020 election, um, of which the, the result the, the military has already announced. Uh, but like uh, the, there, there are like several um, uh, politicians in that committee, and then like they are kind of like dealing with the international community, the UN, to like uh, take measures against the hunter, and then people. Uh, want the official recognition from the international community uh, uh, to these to that group as the legitimate government of Myanmar, other than uh, not the military. Uh, the military uh, do not recognize the military as a legitimate government of Myanmar. And there, um, uh, the people have been also talking about like uh, cutting the revenue sources of the military, like in, uh, so far, like the although there are sanctions from like. Uh, international community, the sanctions are uh, targeted sanctions uh, against uh, against a uh, coup leader like Me Online and uh, several other generals. So uh, people talk about the uh, sanctions against the military conglomerate like uh, uh, and uh, it is M M E H L. Yeah, and then like. Uh, I think U U.S., U.K., and Canada, uh, Canada has already done that. So, like, uh, uh, to, to put sanction on the military, like companies and then entities, and uh, the business is basically like uh, putting sanction on the business that could like uh, directly benefit the military, uh, including the oil and gas, uh, which uh, the military has and billions of uh, profits uh, every year. Okay, thanks, Roma. I'd like to bring you in. You're based in Tokyo. Um, Japan is obviously one of the key regional players. Just, just to start off with, how does the situation look from Japan and how are your clients reading this situation? Well, thank you, uh, Ian. Uh, thank you, Etain and Lynn, uh, for uh, letting me speak on this panel alongside you. And uh, first of all, my uh, condolences 
the families of the victims of the crackdown so far, and my thoughts are with the people of Myanmar in those very difficult times. I lived in uh, Myanmar first in 2006, and then from uh, 2008 and 2015. And uh, at the time, uh, the country was moving in a positive direction. It's, uh, it's tragic to see uh, what is happening. So there is also some hope with uh, people like yourselves and any other Myanmar people uh, active to try to, to make things better. Uh, but really now looking at the at the Japan and the business community, um, I mean, the, the views have evolved. Uh, as the Japanese contact was telling me uh, in short, at first we thought it would be like the Tensei era, but now we realize that we are back to the Tenshui era. And so I think really what that means is that uh, the first, let's say two weeks after the coup, uh, I think the, many uh, people in the business community, including in Japan, thought that uh, from a democratic perspective, this was a, a bad thing that had just happened. However, uh, there was a likelihood that uh, some type of enlightened uh, de uh, authoritarian government would take over and uh, um, quicken uh, economic reforms and that stability would remain. Um, maybe somewhat similar to what uh, has been happening in Thailand since 2014. But very quickly, it became clear that uh, this was not going to be the case because of the events on the ground, the protests, the civil disobedience movement, um, and uh, now the crackdown. And so at first, uh, I saw operational issues becoming a, a for, um, coming to the forefront for example, uh, uh, companies asking, uh, what do I do when my employees want to join the civil disobedience movement? Um, how do I deal with that legally? Another request uh, by many employees why, was that they don't want to pay income tax anymore to a government that they do not consider to be legitimate. So how does a foreign investor deal with such requests being between uh, the employees and uh, the military government? So that was that. And then uh, things evolved into um, evacuation of non-essential staff. Um, then the, the sanctions being adopted, meaning the need to review uh, business partnerships with suppliers or, or joint venture partners to ensure that one does not have any interaction with uh, sanctioned entities. And now, really, it's a, it's a broader reputation issue. We can, can a company uh, that might be listed on a global stock exchange that has various stakeholders and shareholders. How can it remain in, a, in Myanmar given the current context? And there are, there are companies talking about responsible exit, but at the same time, and um, I would say the last thing there, it's a, especially from the perspective of Japan, there is, a, and other countries as well, I think there is a, there is a lot of, um, of disappointment uh, towards uh, uh, the, the Myanmar military because the last 10 years have been a, a decade of tremendous progress for the economy. And uh, there is reluctant, uh, I mean, many investors and countries are reluctant to pull out because they feel that will not uh, benefit their own interests, of course, but also the interests of the Myanmar people. And so it's really a dilemma. And I think this is why to, until now, the, the sanctions have been very uh, limited, targeted and slowly ramped up but because of the events on the ground, the, the room for maneuver and to operate in a nuanced way is uh, shrinking by the day. Thanks. And when we look across the region, obviously there are other pow powerful players, China and India, both bordering Myanmar, ASEAN, of which Myanmar is a member, and of course the US from um, a, a slightly greater distance. Um, do you think that any of these um, major players in, in, in this drama can influence the actors on the ground, whether on the military side or on the protest side? Do you see a, a role for international engagement? Well, I see a role for both international engagement and international pressure. And definitely there is no single player that can um, influence the Myanmar military to uh, in a sufficient way that it adjusts the course that it has decided it will adopt uh, at whatever the cost uh, on its population or on its economy. And I think the main challenge at the moment is a lack of coordination 
between uh, the various uh, players, uh, foreign players. So on one hand, I think we see good and increasing coordinated approach by uh, the EU, the US, Canada, Australia. Um, but uh, when one look at ASEAN, for example, there is clearly a division in views between uh, maritime uh, ASEAN with uh, especially Indonesia taking a leading role in trying to broker some mediation, but then clear reluctance by Vietnam, to some degree Thailand to uh, interfere, as they say, into the domestic issue of Myanmar. Um, and I think the uh, same in, in China and in India, there is, uh, I think a big question that uh, decision makers are asking themselves is, what do I have to lose by going in that quagmire alone and uh, to what extent are my partners or even, uh, let's say, strategic competitors, when one thinks about the US and China, will be willing to work alongside me in order to resolve such a challenging crisis with such a stubborn uh, stakeholder like the Myanmar military. Mm, thanks very much. Ethan, you're from Rakhine State, um, bordering with Bangladesh and with India in, in, in the West. Um, the last time that Myanmar was this prominent on the international agenda was in 2017 when the Rohingya crisis erupted. And that of course was above all in Rakhine. How, how do things look from Rakhine and how also do they look for the Rohingya going forwards? Um, well, uh, thanks uh, very much for this question. Uh, let me start with, um, with, the, with, the, with the Rohingya situation. Um, I think uh, what, you know, what, what seems like sort of a silver climbing from you know, a really dark cloud is uh, the fact that a lot of people are, are softening their attitude towards the Rohingya people, people across the country. So we should remember that the, the Rohingya minority until the coup had been the most hated and the most unwanted minority in this country. And, and it, it's, it's really, personally speaking, it's really encouraging to see so many people across the country uh, sending, for example, letters of apologies to the Rohingya people for the crimes which the, which the Myanmar state have committed against them and for the fact that they have, they have turned a blind eye to their long-standing suffering. So uh, this is a really positive uh, encouragement. And as we all know, uh, both uh, Dr. Sasa, Myanmar's special envoy to the UN, and the CRPH, the uh, the the, uh, the the de facto uh, Myanmar's de facto government made up of uh, MPs elect, they are both uh, of, sort of officially endorsing the term Rohingya, and we should wish it's worth recalling that Aung San Suu Kyi herself had consistently refused. Uh, to call them uh, by this name. So this is a, a really significant change. And I hope that uh, they, they, they honor this commitment long after the crisis is over, which we all know won't be anytime soon. So that's, that's what, I like, what I would like to say on the, about the Ranger issue for now. Then if we turn to the, uh, to, to, to the Rakhines in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the current crisis, um, uh, so uh, before, I think after the coup, uh, after the coup, the uh, Rakhine's main political party, AMP, uh, was the first sort of amongst the first victim to fall to, to, fall to, to the military's uh, wooing, sort of political wooing. Uh, so a, a, key, a key person, uh, the spokes, spokesperson, Do A. Nung Singh, uh, a, a, a very prominent uh, politician amongst ethnic Rakhine people. Uh, she, she was offered and she accepted a, a, a seat at the highest level of uh, state, the so-called uh, uh, State Administration Council. And that was, and, and after f following that, uh, I mean, which this also divided uh, Rakhines about, you know, where they should stand re with regard to, to the coup. But then basically what we have seen is that most Rakhines have stayed out of the coup as it, by saying that, you know, sort of to, to, to put it crudely, this is a fight between uh, two authoritarian groups. One is a military authoritarian uh, 
institution and the other is a civilian sort of authoritarian uh, regime. For them, uh, the NLD, which, uh, which unfortunately had taken a rather hardline approach towards the, uh, to the Rakhine people in the, in the two preceding years, they think that these two groups are, you know, crudely speaking, indistinguishable from one another. So, so in terms of uh, popular protest out on the street, Rakai has also been, I think, the only uh, a minority, uh, you know, minority uh, nationality area where we haven't seen uh, uh, a significant protest. Of course, there have been a, a few uh, small-scale protests in in a few and a number of our townships in Rakhine. Okay, thanks. Just quickly, Roma, is the Rohingya issue um, being debated by your clients? Is it surfacing in the context you're having? Well, it was an issue for some companies uh, back in 2017. Um, I mean, you, you, it affected uh, the relationship, the business relationship between certain companies and the military conglomerates at the time even though the military conglomerates were not sanctioned in the end. Um, so, no, I think to be frank, right now, the focus is more on uh, what's happening in the rest of the country. Uh, mm. However, uh, what I understand is that at the regional level, uh, there is um, a push by the state administrative council to try to um, instrumentalize the Rohingya crisis to its benefit with uh, the, the junta uh, going to uh, regional partners, including Bangladesh, and asserting that it's going to fast track the repatriation of uh, the Rohingya population from the camps. So a way to try to buy support from these neighboring countries and to uh, position itself as a solution for a problem that it uh, started itself. Mm, thanks. Lynn. Um, we've touched on the issue of Myanmar's complex ethnic makeup, um, officially 135 ethnic groups and, you know, the Burma plus seven other major groups, which cluster the minor, the, the, the lesser groups within them. Um, what is the view among Myanmar people, again, going back to the street, if you like, to the protest movement, about the future of, say, the peace process or inter-ethnic relations inside Myanmar? Um, I think this school has like um, dismantled the whole like uh, concept of like in the past Myanmar people are uh, they 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 know that the military is brutal but that they did not witness this on their own like especially from Mark, like, like those who live in the uh, heartland of the country. So in ethnic areas like in Rakhine, like in uh, Rohingya area, they have been killing people, like burning the houses uh, and robbing and stuff like that. But like it's in the news. Uh, some, uh, well, like for Rohingya, it's like often like the news is distorted and uh, like uh, in the local media, it's often not uh, uh, presented in a favorable way to the Rohingya anyway. But like. Rakhine and other parts of the country, Kachin, Shan, uh, the, 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 it's always in the news, like in the private like, uh, media outlets. Uh, but uh, in the but like people, they did not like Burma people. They did not witness the situation like uh, on their own. So um, uh, for for the past two years, like Burma people have been like uh, quite. Um, uh, they were kind of like supporting the army uh, for the fight against the uh, ethnic Rakhine people. Some Burma people, not all of uh, all of uh, all of us. Well, and then like uh, it, it it creates a lot of like uh, bad relationship between the ethnic and uh, 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 ethnic minority and Burma, like the majority. Uh, but then like now the, the all the fight uh, all the uh, crackdown and operations are like at the center of the. Uh, Myanmar and like in, in the big cities like Yangon and Mandalay, we all witness how brutal the military is. Uh, we all have witnessed uh, how they like uh, put houses in fire, how they kill the people, how uh, how they are like uh, even even the children like they are not uh, spared from the uh, these like brutality. So Burma people feel uh, like they they can now like totally empathize the. Uh, a hardship uh, the, the, that the ethnic minority had faced for the past 
several decades. So uh, the there has been like like Aileen already said like uh, people have uh, issued apology letter to the Rohingya and also to the other ethnic minorities and uh, they they have all also like uh, show their support to the uh, uh, ethnic armed organizations. In the past, these ethnic armed organizations are like rebellions. So uh, according, according to the uh, military, uh, they were always like named them as a rebellion and people think that all oh, these people are like bad people. They are fighting uh, against uh, our army and something like that. But now they, uh, they are showing like their solidarity and support to the ethnic armed organization. And then uh, people are even start. They started even talking about uh, forming the federal army, the uh, army with the representation of all the ethnic uh, minorities. Uh, because right now in the in the army, like most of the people in the senior level are uh, not most, like almost all of them are like the Ma people. And if somebody is a believer of like uh, uh, Christian or like. Uh, is the, like if, if they are uh, not Buddhist or like if they are not Bama, they may not get the uh, higher level in the military. So uh, people want to like uh, disband the whole institution, uh, the military as a whole institution, and replace it with the federal army, like the uh, with the equal representation of um, uh, ethnic minority in the in the army as well as like give equal opportunity and the, uh, uh, and uh, self-determination and uh, federalism to the other ethnic minorities. So the Burma people has changed the, con uh, changed the opinion, like their mindset quite a lot these days. Uh, that's very interesting and encouraging. We still have a long road, but then uh, if things go, uh, go back to like, uh, uh, I mean, if things are going well and uh, if we can get a, a democracy at the end, uh, I think the relationship between the ethnic minority and the uh, uh, majority would improve a lot. Mm, thanks. Looking to the future, we've got a couple of questions that have been submitted about the degree of support that the military retains inside Myanmar now, kind of two months on from the coup. But there's a larger question there. Um, which, which side might be able to prevail here, you know, military on the one hand, protest movement on the other hand, or are we in fact more likely to be looking at a, a long stalemate between the two sides where, where, where neither is, is able to prevail and it just becomes a very, very messy situation. Ethane, um, do you have a view on that? Thanks uh, very much uh, for this question again. Uh, Professor Holiday, I think it's it's a really difficult question, and it, I would I would kind of hazard uh, my uh, if in my opinion here. Um, the, the, first of all, uh, I I am really um, impressed and honored by the by the level of bravery that the people of Myanmar have shown in the past two months. You now we have you know, we have teenagers, we have people in their early 20s and people in you know and and people of all ages standing up against a brutal uh, military regime which has which have not stopped and which will not stop at anything to to you know to keep their hold on on power so every day people have been you know people know that they they will they they run they run the risk of getting shot at and getting killed on the streets and despite this you know they go out to the streets every day to 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 show that they 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 reject this military coup and they want uh, you know democracy and, and and freedom for 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 the country so uh, uh, I think if we take if we take this this as an indication of how things might turn out in the future, I think we are in for uh, the 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 junta are in for a really uh, determined and long battle. And we also have the 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 CDM movement, uh, the civil disobedience movement, led mostly uh, involving uh, civil servants of of the country. Th that is still going very strong, and it has received. Enormous support, you know, both uh, uh, you know, financial and other other means uh, from the people. 
you know, I know for a fact that a lot of ordinary people are, you know, giving away a significant amount of their income to, to keep, uh, uh, to support uh, uh, civil servants who are joining uh, this movement. And if we, if we take um, commentaries in the hunter controlled newspapers, we know that they are really afraid of uh, the, the possibility that the CDM would succeed. Because after this point, because of, I think, uh, because of CDM, they are, you know, the, 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 the government, uh, prayed, the bureaucracy has been kind of uh, paralyzed and we still have many, many ministries not being able to uh, operate. So, and the other thing I think, if we're, if we're talking about how this is going to turn out, uh, I think a key element is an, a, a key, maybe not deciding factor, but maybe a really uh, crucial factor would be the kind of support we, we get, the people of Myanmar get from the international uh, community, for the international community. And in my, in my observation and, uh, and really humble analysis, this, there has never been a time when the, the military bloc has been the, the least supported and the most isolated and in, in the most precarious situation, which is why they are really resorting to all kinds of brutal tactics on a detector's you know, uh, manual. You know, they are really, uh, you know, the, the more brutal I think uh, they are becoming, you know, the more that's in a way that the one way to interpret that will be that they are really uh, desperate. So, uh, I mean, I would still like to take this opportunity to, to really make, a, a give three quick reasons why the international community should help, you know. Uh, uh, one is like moral. It's, it's you know, this is not just, uh, you know, politics or a dispute over what kind of government uh, we should practice. This is, uh, we are up against uh, a brutal, kind of a group of armed thugs who have shown by their action that they don't observe, and they don't observe, they don't care or observe any norms whatsoever. For example, who would shoot a five-year-old child who is at home? You know, who would shoot a medical staff, mem you know, a medi medical staff who is looking after somebody who has been, who is in a critical condition. So, I mean, this is why the international community need to show their solidarity and do everything they can to help us win this fight against evil, you know. And the other thing is, again, what would be the cost for the international community uh, to, to help us? And what would be the cost of inaction from the part of the international community? So, I mean, if they all chip in, I think it would result in a situation where many lives would have been saved, more than 50 million. Okay, we just lost Ethan there. Um, I'm going to pass to Lynn. Lynn, just, just one question um, about the extent of military support. We know that in Myanmar in the old days, if you wanted to get even decent cooking oil, you know, access to a good supply of rice, that you needed to know somebody in the military. I mean, that was the supply chain. Um, so there must still be people who have links with the military. And what, what's your estimation of the support in the society for the military? Well, there is no official figure, but the um, uh, latest reference that we could make is by the 2020 election. So in the 2020 election, there was the military proxy body, the Union Solidarity and Development Party, and uh, they won like 20% uh, of the votes, total votes. Uh, so uh, roughly, like we can say, like there are 20% uh, of the people who are kind of like supporting the military. But then I would say that that number is like dropping uh, after the coup because like uh, people who are not even interested in politics, uh, like who didn't go and vote, uh, they became like uh, like in my friends, uh, like in in, the, in my neighborhood or like my friends, like people who had never talk about politics, uh, they were so frustrated about what is happening, and then like. Uh, their support uh, for the various like 
they are no, they they won't support the military for sure. And then, and then, uh, are, like I said earlier, there are people like who supported the military uh, for the fight uh, against the Rohingya or like ethnic minority. But then, like now, they have witnessed the situation. They no longer like. Uh, support the military for anything that they did. So on, on the social media, like in the past, like we can see that um, the Aung San Suu Kyi government, if they has already said that like Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD government, uh, they talk about the reconciliation. So people are like, when, after the uh, 2011, like, uh, when we are transitioned to the uh, like a quasi-civilian government, so people quickly like, uh, forget about the, what the military did in the past. They no longer talk about the, uh, taking revenge or anything, but like the, their view on the transition of justice has changed quite a lot in the uh, past like, two months, uh, basically. And then now people are uh, talking about like, uh, these people, these, like, uh, the perpetrators must be punished. And, and then they were even saying that even if uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, 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 was released and then like uh, she she wanted to make any like negotiation with the military uh we will not accept it uh like it is the will of the people to punish the military like uh, to, uh, to to get the, the perpetrator accountable for what they did thanks lynn uh a question on china which i'm going to ask to roman uh from tom hagan can you share your view on the role of china the tatmador is spinning the story that the coup is an anti-China move in reaction to Aung San Suu Kyi's pro-China stance. What would you say? Well, thank you for this question. Um, I think it's essential to look at the relationship with China from the perspective of Myanmar. And because I see you know, comparisons done uh, with Venezuela or Iran, for example, and how uh, uh, hard uh, Western sanctions against those two countries have benefited China that, had me, that has been able to pick up some uh, oil and gas projects or infrastructure projects in those countries. I also hear about the comparison with uh, Laos and Cambodia, where uh, China, to some extent, has been able to establish a client state uh, relationship uh, with the regimes there, whether the, the Laos, uh, Vietnamese uh, Communist Party, sorry, the Laos Communist Party or uh, Hun Sen's regime in Cambodia. Uh, however, in um, Myanmar, I think beyond what uh, the um, military, the state administrative council is spinning now with this uh, Israeli lobbyist that apparently will be going to Washington DC to uh, advocate on their behalf. I think beyond that, really, if we take a step back and look at what happened uh, in, uh, in 2010 and, and the, the opening process afterwards on the uh, former General Tensei, one of the objectives was clearly to diversify uh, options for uh, Myanmar in terms of the foreign countries that it could deal with. Maybe not necessarily the US and uh, the EU and, and the West, but uh, you know, Japan uh, and uh, South Korea and, and others. And so, um, I think putting aside uh, what the military is saying, uh, if we look at what has happened in the past, um, I, I have a difficulty uh, seeing the Tamado uh, positioning itself as um, willing to engage in a relationship of vassality or a client state to China. And this is why they will undertake this coup. I, I don't think it adds up. Um, and one last thing, I mean, it's true that uh, on the, um, uh, the NLD government led by Aung San Suu Kyi, the relationship with China was relatively good. China remains the first trading uh, and investment partner of Myanmar, if you include uh, Hong Kong in the mainland China figure. And uh, the China-Myanmar economic corridor was moving slowly. The NLD government was negotiating carefully the terms of the agreements, especially around the Chao Pyu uh, Special Economic Zone. However, the dialogue was moving forward. And so I, I, think, uh, I think China has more to lose than to win in the uh, current, uh, in, because of the current coup, and even more now because of the current instability. Of course, China will uh, uh, engage with whoever ends up winning and uh, Myanmar's neighbors, there is access to the Gulf of Bengal and other geostrategic interests. But I, I, in my view, I don't think China is coming out of this as a winner. And another uh, 
uh, things that you sometimes hear. I don't believe that China uh, approved the coup or encouraged the military to undertake the coup, as you can hear sometimes. Thanks. Ethan, uh, turning back to you, the other great power on Myanmar's border is India. Uh, there's very little talk of India in, in, the, in the social media, um, in the regular media. Um, India seems to be kind of floating somewhere below the radar. How do you read the role of India? Um, uh, well, I, I think uh, it, it, it's compared to other big, uh, uh, big neighbors like uh, China, for example, people, as far as the general population of Myanmar is concerned, uh, India is distant and, you know, it's not really sort of, uh, it's, it's uh, I think in, in contemporary Myanmar, it's, people don't really often talk about uh, long-standing ties uh, between uh, the, two, the two countries. So, uh, and uh, I would just to, to give you an example, and uh, when, when the protests uh, were really at its uh, apex, um, uh, people uh, in, in Yangon uh, staged protests in front of, for example, the Chinese embassy, also for many days in front of the American embassy and, and, and in front of the Japanese embassy. But I'm not aware that there was any big protest in front of the, uh, the Indian embassy, which is right at the, at the uh, it, it's really close to the, the Sule border, which had been a, a really a, a center for uh, protest. So uh, I think it's, it's somehow uh, people uh, kind of under, I think kind of underappreciate uh, the, the role uh, India has played and maybe the role India could uh, potentially played. But in the past few days, what has attracted people's attention is uh, what seems like a, a, a real, a genuine letter uh, uh, from the Indian government uh, asking uh, the, uh, the local government, I think, I'm not sure if it's in Missouri or some, somewhere else, uh, to take kind of a hardline approach to people fleeing the situation uh, in, in Myanmar. Uh, we should know that uh, uh, quite, quite a significant number of police officers and others uh, have um, fled the country uh, after the coup uh, on to, into the Indian, uh, Indian side of the border. Mm. Okay, thanks. Lynn, um, we've talked a lot about what's actually happening on the street. We've, there's two questions about the humanitarian dimension. One is whether medical supplies are still being distributed in, in Myanmar. And the other is whether there's an international humanitarian effort on the ground, given that many people are facing very, very difficult situations in, just in their daily lives. Um, yeah, so in terms of the medical supply, uh, like uh, I heard that like uh, things like ART, like the, the medicine for the people with HIV, is like difficult to like distribute it to the people. Um, maybe uh, also because of the uh, shootings and uh, indiscriminate shootings and killings on, on the ground. Um, uh, but then the in terms of the stocks, like the medical supplies are still available. Uh, uh, on the other hand, like uh, because the doctors are like leading the civil disobedience movement, they are no, uh, the, a lot of the public hospitals are now uh, they are now closed, uh, and like uh, uh, people like uh, can go to some of the uh, military hospital, but then like uh, they don't have enough staff either. Uh, the, so the in terms of the like getting the medical like uh, uh, treatment, it is a little bit difficult for the people, especially those like who, uh, those vulnerable and uh, poor, because like uh, rich people can still go to the uh, private hospitals uh, and. Uh, However, like there are uh, the, the uh, doctors participating in the uh, civil disobedience movement, they still run the free clinics, so uh, several people can still go there. So it's, uh, it's the situation is uh, hard to like uh, assess because like um, uh, people on the ground, like, uh, they are facing a lot of hardship. Uh, at the same time, they have some other alternative alternatives as well. Uh, so in terms of the humanitarian access, uh, uh, it's, it's also similar. So in uh, areas like Yangon, like in the past, uh, in places like Nainbaya, they all have the job, like they all have uh, uh, access to income. And then like, with the coup and like right now, like, all the uh, 
crackdown and the martial law, people in that areas are really vulnerable. But like for the NGOs and the like uh, humanitarian actors to quickly respond to that situation is like not very easy. But then uh, one thing uh, we should keep in mind is that Myanmar is a country like where people love doing charity. So there have been a lot of like uh, groups. Uh, it's not like formal organizations like NG, international NGOs or local NGOs, but like uh, local uh, like people uh, led by the community. Like uh, they donate money, they uh, buy stuff for the people, and, and like distribute it uh, to the people in Thailand and other places. Uh, so uh, that kind of like charity thing is uh, very like uh, popular right now, and then a lot of people are supporting and donating the money. Uh, but uh, like we uh, said earlier, because of the economic hardship, like everybody, the income level is like reduced uh, somehow. So uh, I'm not uh, really sure how sustainable it is in the long run. Thanks. Hey, Thane, um, paraphrasing, paraphrasing a couple of the questions we've received. Is there anything looked at from a military perspective that appears to be going right within these last few weeks? Um, for instance, shutting down the internet overnight to minimize the social media contact, um, even dealing with street protests. You know, do, you, do you think there's anything the military leaders can look at and say, we're getting on top of this now? Um, well, uh, in my assessment, I don't. I don't think they are, I don't, I don't see any uh, evidence on the ground which suggests that they are in control and you know, they are doing things right. Uh, even in, for example, if we, if we only uh, talk about protest, even in areas where they have really brutally and heavily cracked down on uh, protesters, there are these, there are smaller scale protests going on. So uh, protesters are now uh, using sort of uh, guerrilla tactics. So they, they, you know, they show up in one place for a couple of minutes and they disperse and then they regroup again in another areas. So, uh, I mean, even despite all, all their kind of, you know, brutality, I, I don't think we can say at this point that the level of opposition has dimin diminished in any way whatsoever. Mm, thanks very much. The question maybe comes from Hong Kong. How do you evaluate the role of the Milk Tea Alliance? Uh, Lynn, maybe I could ask you that one. Yeah, so um, I think Myanmar people in the past, uh, because of we are not uh, very familiar with the international solidarity. So when like when the protests are ongoing in Hong Kong, in Thailand, people are like, uh, uh, they were not very interested uh, because, uh, like in our country as well, there are a lot of like conflicts and things uh, that we should uh, be uh, thinking about. But then, like uh, studying from the multi uh, like uh, multi alliance, like uh, it, it's quite popular on Twitter and then also on Facebook. Uh, the uh, the social influencer and celebrity they endorse it. So, uh, and then like we receive the. Uh, manual uh, from Hong Kong and as well uh, as well as like Thailand you know, uh, together I think so uh, they, there was a day where like Hong Kong Thailand um, and Myanmar like they came out and protest on the same day as a, in, in, as a form of showing solidarity so people are like uh, they they recognize this alliance more and more and then uh, especially in like uh, Thailand it's not one neighboring country and then they they are also like uh, struggling against a, like a dictatorship in their own country so uh, because of the protests here we can see the impact uh, direct impact in uh, Thailand and then people are like uh, uh, they value the solidarity more and more like compared to the past like people where people didn't really like know anything about it uh, they now like uh, talk about the global solidarity. They talk about Hong Kong. They are interested in Hong Kong politics. They are interested in like uh, Joshua Wong, and they are interested in politics of Thailand as well. So I think it's a positive sign. Okay, Ethan, I've got a question here, which looks a little naive, but I think it, it could be interesting to to tackle it. It says this: Is racism an issue in Myanmar? Now, I, I think the question is. Is racism becoming a different issue in Myanmar as a result of the last two months? What would you say? Hey, Thane. 
Is the question to Lin or myself? Uh, for oh, you. Okay. For you. Thank, think, thank yeah. you, Professor uh, Holiday. Yeah. Uh, I would just like to add a really important point to my to my answer to your earlier question that whether the, the military has succeeded or not. Uh, so in this country, the most basic unit is the local ward or uh, village administration office. So this is the most important and the most basic component of the whole you know administration apparatus. Two months into the coup, they have no the, the, this this basic unit has remained paralyzed. They have no, despite all their attempts, despite all their threats and everything they have done, they have not been able to keep this running again. So I think this is very important and a very important indication that they are not succeeding at all. Yeah, so, and then to your current uh, question, um, I think the worst form of racism we have seen in the context of the uh, Rohingya crisis and, and, and I mean, I think every country in the world has their fair share of people who are racist. And, and in our country, uh, due to a, a number of kind of uh, unfortunate factors, we seem to have a lot more people who are racist, but I don't mean this in the innate sense. Uh, for example, when it comes to the, the Rohingya people, a lot of ordinary people have simply been misinformed or they have been fed you know, anti-Islamic propaganda for many decades by the regime and also by you know uh, ultra nationalist uh, uh, discourses. So now it's it's you know all these discourses are coming apart and people are realizing that you know they are just you know one of us and that and, you know they belong to this country. So and the other thing is that uh, you know uh, as we are seeing the the the, the you know the you know the, the full scale of the hundreds brutality, people are all these existing uh, kind of divisions, whether, wh whether these are along ethnic, religious, or you know, any other kind of lines, these are all coming apart. And what we are seeing is kind of unprecedented sense of unity among people uh, you know, across the country, people who belong to, who, people from all kinds of backgrounds. Yes, it has been an issue, but what we are now seeing is kind of a great opening you know, to, to deal with and to really make you know, great progress on this issue. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we've just passed the hour, so I should start to wrap this up. Um, one final question for all three panelists, and I'll just go through each of you in turn, maybe with Roman first and Ethane second and Lynn third. If we look ahead to February the 1st, 2022, so one year on from the coup, what do you think will be the situation in Myanmar then? A kind of realistic assessment, Romain? I'll be realistic, but uh, I will also be hopeful. And uh, so I think re realistically, the military will uh, stay on and keep control of the armed forces, obviously, but also part of the state. However, and I think that's where uh, I, I'm trying to be hopeful, I think they, because of its contradictions, the military wants to control, but it also wants to open up. And so it wants to keep the economy open. It, it retains the, the, the telecommunication services somewhat open. And so what I'm hoping for is that uh, positive forces of change, including uh, businesses and uh, humanitarian actors and the international community make use of this space to remain engaged in Myanmar and isolate the military as a political actor and business actor in its own country. But I think the only way for that to happen is by being active with uh, the forces on the ground, uh, both domestic and foreign. Thank you. Ethane, one year on from the coup, what, what's your expectation? Um, <laughs> I, I hope that, um, we, 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 I hope that we are uh, back in a democracy and that perpetrators of you know, all the crimes have been, have been brought to justice, but I expect it to drag on. And um, I, unfortunately, my, my, my hunch at this point is that we would be in a much worse uh, situ situation in, in, you know, any, in many aspects than we currently are. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn, over to you. I mean, I'll just say that there are a number of, of actors that 
desperately want to prevent that from happening. I mean, other members of ASEAN, China doesn't want uh, instability on its Western border. Um, the US doesn't want to see instability. You know, no, nobody really wants to see that. Maybe I could just press you, Athane, and, and uh, does, does that give any hope for resolution? Um, given that so, so many people would have an interest in that not happening. Um, well, I, uh, oh, sorry, is it yeah, to Lynn or myself? Well, I was asking it to Athane before coming to Lynn for the final word, but, you know, do you think there might be a kind of counterbalance to the, um, the rather di kind of distressing scenario that you just outlined? Athane. I, I, yeah, I would, I mean, to the international community and, you know, friends of people of Myanmar, I would, I would say, I would send a very simple message. Uh, listen to, to what people are saying on the ground, you know, listen to our message. And I think it, it's what the international community, including the, uh, the, the ASEAN, um, the ASEAN countries and, and other more powerful um, countries, you know, what, what you should do is be articulated by people like Dr. Sasa and many other people who are more, you know, who are better qualified than myself. So if you want to prevent, you know, the kind of situation that I expect, you know, it will, it, it will turn out, then please listen to what we are saying and, and you know, uh, and act and act really fast because we are really running out. We are really running out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. Final word from you about what your expectations are for a, a year on from the coup. Um, so I think the military so far they haven't shown any like uh, will to like negotiate with the uh, protest movement, like the leaders or anybody else. They keep saying that they they, they would like to like uh, they will continue with the five points program, uh, and then like uh, they are uh, they did not accept uh, UN. Uh, UN offer for the dialogue and stuff like that. So uh, and that's like uh, and then the on the side of the uh, resistance, like people are not going to like back down. Uh, so uh, the confrontation will go on, and unless there is a uh, like uh, like Aiden already said, like intervention from the international community, like uh, effective and strong intervention, uh, things will like go. Uh, Pretty badly in the future. I don't think it is anything that China or like uh, U.S. or the neighboring country of like Myanmar wants. But uh, uh, in the uh, few uh, in the year uh, in the coming year, like if things are going like this, uh, there will be more like a civil war, like a large scale civil war, and the country could uh, become a failed state. So uh, unless we have the effective uh, assistance from the international community. Things are going to get worse because if the if uh, if the people give up, like the military will uh, rule us forever. So uh, the military is willing to like talk only willing to talk to the people who bear arms, like the armed actors. So um, when many people are like they feel like Burma people, like the majority of us, we need to bear arms as well. We need to fight against the military. So uh, if things are going to that direction, Myanmar will become another failed state in, uh, in, the, in Asia, and it will be bad for the, all the uh, neighboring country, China, uh, the US, India, and like, everybody. Thanks very much, Roma. Athane, Lynn, thanks very much for a fascinating hour of discussion. Um, sobering and, and, and insightful. Uh, many thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm gonna hand back to Alice. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Holliday, and thank you to our uh, wonderful panelists, uh, Romain, Lynn, and Nathang. Uh, we learned a lot this afternoon, and I'm going to keep hopeful for the developments and for the people of, of Myanmar. Uh, and, you know, Asia Society Hong Kong will continue to monitor and hopefully will be bringing uh, future programs like this. Uh, not just Asia Society Hong Kong, but the Asia Society Global Network, um, our head office in New York and, and also office in DC. I know they have friends that there's connections. I know they're also monitoring the situation very closely. So stay tuned uh, with the Asia Society uh, Global Network for future programs like this. And again, my, you know, my uh, heartfelt gratitude to all four of you uh, for enlightening us and especially two of you on the ground for giving us the view directly 
uh, from Myanmar. And have a wonderful afternoon. And we look forward to welcoming you back at future Asia Society Hong Kong programs, including our COVID-19 update series. Uh, we will be our next speaker, episode 29. And we're going to hear from a, a speaker from Haifa University talking about Israel's uh, rollout of the vaccine and how Hong Kong can learn from that situation. Again, my heartfelt Thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon, and please stay safe and look forward to welcoming you at future programs. Thank you.